Hi everyone, welcome back to NTI's Japan Real Estate Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Ziv Nakajima again. Great to have you with us as always. Today we're going to discuss some investment hotspots and try to rate them based on different investment criteria, pros and cons, etc. We've discussed this topic a bit in the past when we were talking about investment strategies in Japan. And if you'll recall, we mentioned that in our opinion, as well as most of our clients, the three main points to keep in mind at all times in order to be successful overall in your property investment here are one, sticking to cities with stable or rising population numbers, which requires some careful due diligence due to the declining nationwide trend. Two, avoiding speculative locations with high entry prices and low rental return yields, simply because economic and property price growth is not exactly a given long term for various reasons. And three, try to steer clear of older houses, which are built of cheap, um, non-durable materials in Japan, unless you're happy tearing them down at a not so distant point in the future to reutilize the land in a more cost efficient manner which, mind you, is a very viable strategy, but something you'll need to be aware of beforehand and obviously have the funds available for. Otherwise, you'll want to stick to condos, uh, preferably reinforced concrete buildings, which can be kept livable for longer and where maintenance and renovation can be estimated a bit more accurately in advance. So with all this in mind, let's look at some of the more popular investment destinations around the country. We'll stick to the uh, bigger and more well-known cities in this episode, but do bear in mind that if you take the time to familiarize yourself with smaller Japanese cities, there are plenty of those that can be very attractive as well for various reasons, and we'll get into that in one of our future episodes as well. So first and foremost, um, Tokyo and Osaka. As we mentioned here when we did our Kyoto deal analysis a few episodes back, Tokyo and Osaka are the most popular investment destinations for international investors, the only places that most international banks will provide investment loans for. And as a result, competition there is quite fierce, and central areas in those cities are more than a bit overpriced for both new and secondhand properties, and that naturally leads to lower yields. Now, this may be attractive if you're financing your purchase, since your cash on cash return, meaning the amount that you'll get monthly compared with the amount of cash that you actually had to fork out of pocket for the purchase, will still be reasonable. But if you're buying cash, like most non-resident foreigners tend to, buying in Tokyo or Osaka will be a very speculative investment with very small returns. Another problem there is that the high price of these properties harms your diversity. So you have far less of an ability to hedge your investments since the same budget will get you less properties, which means less income streams and less diversity across locations, socioeconomic profiles, which you will be able to get if you stick to other locations. On the upside, if and when prices do go up in Japan, which again is far from given, Tokyo and Osaka tend to appreciate more. If you do want to try and aim for potential growth, but you don't want to sacrifice your cash flow or your monthly returns, it's probably better to target Fukuoka City, which again, we've covered here in the past. It's the biggest city in Western Japan, famous for being Japan's uh, startup hub, very popular with East Asian uh, tourists and business people. And it has been rising in prices almost as sharply as Tokyo in recent years. But in Fukuoka, those prices starting point was a lot lower than Tokyo and Osaka. So rental returns there are still substantially higher, although that gap is shrinking. Another overpriced and overhyped location is Niseko, which is probably Japan's most internationally famous ski resort town. Located in Hokkaido, it first became popular with Australian winter sport enthusiasts about a decade ago. And now it's very well known for other nationalities as well. Beautiful place, very foreigner friendly, but also very, very expensive to buy in. Normal lease returns there, long-term leases are also very low as a result. But the advantage of Niseko is that foreigners are very well integrated into the local scene there, including the local municipality, which makes it far more accessible to non-Japanese speakers. And perhaps most importantly, you can get more creative there as far as short-term rentals are concerned, which is a big plus. 
considering that the rest of the country, as we've heard here um, in the past from Paul Feinberg, is actually trending the other way and is becoming stricter as far as building and resort management companies are concerned, as well as legislation. In Niseko, where there are many foreign homeowners who only use their properties once or twice a year, it's far easier to lease your property to short-stay holiday makers, and that does make for higher returns, even on pricier properties. Also up in Hokkaido is Sapporo City, one of Japan's bigger metropolitan centers with a population of just under 2 million people. Sapporo is actually one of the cheapest and highest yielding locations in Japan, as far as rental income is concerned, because prices there took a significant hit after the 311 tsunami and the subsequent Fukushima nuclear spillage. Um, because tourism, which is one of the city's main economic drivers, almost completely ceased. The tourists are now back, but prices are still very affordable, and because rents haven't dropped nearly as sharply, this margin makes for very attractive deals cash flow-wise. Now, Sapporo isn't really pegged for growth, price-wise or population-wise, but returns there are very good, and considering the size of the city and the diversity of its economy, it ticks a lot of the boxes for many investors. Unique caveats to Sapporo are that due to the cold winters up there, there's about half of the year which is quite hard for repopulating vacant units, since tenants don't tend to move around much between October and April, which are the snowy months. Also, the city is quite um, old school in its character, which means that tenancies do tend to be longer than in other locations. People don't move around as much, but so are vacancies. The average tenant age also tends to be older, which can mean you might experience an occasional death in a property. Fortunately, though, insurance coverage uh, for this sort of unfortunate event is quite cheap in Japan, only about 1,500 Japanese yen or 13 or so US dollars per year. So nothing unmanageable. Another unique aspect of Sapporo is that due to the large space that the city occupies, properties tend to be bigger there. So while in most other places around the country, high yielding properties would be one or two bedrooms at most, in Sapporo, it's not uncommon to find larger properties, say three, four, or even five bedrooms, that are still yielding good returns percentage-wise. And that size normally means family tenants, as opposed to singles or couples, which again translates into longer tenancies. On the downside, though, these larger properties do require more expensive renovations and repairs between vacancies, as opposed to a studio or one-bedroom unit, which is quite cheap to prepare for the next tenant. Another popular large city is Yokohama, which is Japan's second biggest city, stone throw away from Tokyo. It's a central area, uh, the central area of Yokohama, which is um, quite expensive on, and low on returns, is quite small. And the rest of the city can still be more affordable and provide higher returns than Tokyo itself. But deals um, in Yokohama are few and far between. Kawasaki, which lies kind of between Tokyo and Yokohama is smaller, only about one and a half million population-wise and rising. Also one of Japan's favorite residential cities uh, is still more reasonably priced than both Tokyo and Yokohama. So if you find a good deal there, don't think twice, grab it. Again, deals are few and far between, unfortunately. Kyoto, which we've covered here in the past, and Nagoya are the last two big cities we'll discuss today. Kyoto, as we've mentioned uh, in our Dean Analysis episode, is Japan's top international tourism destination alongside Tokyo and hasn't gone up in price uh, as sharply as some of the other cities have. So still good deals to be had there occasionally. Nagoya, which is one of Japan's biggest industrial centers, also has good deals on paper, but the population there does tend to be a bit rougher around the edges due to the industrial and manufacturing aspect of the place. So you can expect slightly higher tenant turnover, occasionally some payment issues. This is generally not a big problem in Japan. And as we've mentioned in our last episode, when we discussed uh, tenant screening and securities, the most you're likely to have to do is just ask someone to move out if they chronically fail to pay the rent. But still, as far as Japan goes, there are more of these cases in Nagoya compared with most other cities. 
that's probably it as far as larger cities and metropolitan centers are concerned. Again, there are also plenty of small towns and cities that can make very good investment destinations as long as you're not too concerned about potential capital growth, which probably shouldn't be your primary criteria in Japan anyway. Places like Kumamoto, Kobe, Chiba, Kurume, Nagasaki, and some of the satellite cities and bedroom communities um, around Tokyo and Yokohama. But we'll get to those in another episode, sometimes in the future. Hope you've enjoyed today's episode, folks. Please do feel free to comment and ask us about anything that we may have left out. Please do share this podcast with your own networks or anyone who may find it interesting. And if you've got a moment, we'd greatly appreciate it if you could give us a rating on the iTunes Store, the Google Play Store, YouTube, or anywhere else where you might have found us. And until next time, happy investing, everyone.